Hey, look, I understand you guys want to get fit. You guys want to have better cardio. But in order to do so, you have to avoid injury. If you get injured, you're going to be sitting on the sidelines. And the longer that you sit on the sidelines, the more time is spent not training, the more time you're going to be regressing. So, you know, it's been 74 days and I haven't felt any aches or pains whatsoever. So I feel like I'm in somewhat of a position to be able to cover this topic, to be able to explain to you guys what you can do to avoid injury. So I've titled this video, How to Become Invincible. And I mean, I, that might be a bit hyperbolic, but literally, like, this is a foolproof, a bulletproof way to uh, level up your running game. So I've uh, chosen to divide this up into five different principles. And uh, we'll go over it by one by one. So first of all, you want to slow down. You know, you, you want to run at a conversational pace most of the time. Initially, 95% of your runs should be easy. Maybe 100% of your runs. I mean, if you look at my Strava, most of my runs have been like literally at like a 545 per kilometer pace, which is very, very doable for most people with some level of beginner fitness. The other thing that I've done that I've benefited from is by filming these videos, I've been taking walking breaks. And so the idea is, is that, you know, let's say you're running a 10K, maybe you can run four to six kilometers first and then take, take a little break in between, uh, in between the run and then start up again after five to 10 minutes. Uh, once you get more fit, once you get stronger, you can just, instead of a walk, slow down your pace a little bit. Or, you know, depending on your workouts, you can continue going at that same speed. But, but don't fear slowing down to a walk. You're not, like, don't let your ego get in the way. You're not going to lose progress by dividing your run in two. Um, obviously you don't want to be running 10 seconds and then walking 20 running 10. I mean, maybe that works for some people, but it's more of a, just like inserting a walk in the middle of your run. It doesn't hurt. If anything, it's going to prevent you from getting hurt. Um, and then the other thing is nasal breathing. So breathing through your nose is going to allow you to kind of get in touch with a more natural pace. You're going to get into zone one and zone two. So those are the recovery uh, zone and the endurance, the base building zone. So by breathing through your nose, you're going to not only um, slow down, but also it's just really beneficial for the microbiome in the nose. It's not good to breathe through your mouth, like it's dehydrating to the mouth, so that can actually uh, exacerbate any dental issues that you may have, especially if you're going on long runs and you're bringing, you know, sugary food and you're breathing through your mouth at the same time. It's a, a recipe for dental issues in the long in the long run. So principle number two is you want to make sure that your form is is correct. You want to have the proper biomechanics. So. As you guys are aware, I encourage everybody to incorporate some level of minimalist or barefoot running into their training. You don't have to necessarily give up wearing your marshmallows, your Nikes, your Hoka's, but I would recommend going out there and trying to incorporate some running raw. What that's going to do is it's going to allow you to get that feedback from the ground and you're going to adjust your running form accordingly such that you can minimize the impact that you're creating and therefore run more comfortably, more sustainably, and injury-free. Also, you want to make sure that your cadence, you know, you want to be quick on your feet. You don't want to have these big steps. Um, you're not sprinting. Like, you're, you're not, when you're running slowly, if you're running slowly to prevent injury, especially in the beginning, you're not trying to run like a sprinter. A sprinter is taking huge strides because they're running fast. But you want to maintain a certain cadence between about 170 to 180 steps per minute. Um, this isn't a golden rule. You can be a little higher or a little lower than that, but that seems to work for most people. And um, when looking at professional athletes, the ones who are actually, you know, 
per, uh, excelling in their sport, they're all kind of within that range. So try and find, try and quicken up your step, try and find your cadence. It might feel awkward at first if you're not used to it, but over time you'll, you'll adapt, right? And so you can think of the combination of running barefoot and incorporating a better cadence. Um, it's kind of like learning how to kiss the ground, right? You're just like, you're just like touching the ground softly. You know, you, you, your foot is hitting the ground and then springing right off the ground. You know, you're not, you're not uh, trying to create a big landing where there's like this jarring impact force. You just want to touch the ground. You know, uh, when you receive a feedback, let's say you're running barefoot, when you step on something that's, uh, that feels unpleasant, that's not necessarily what I would call pain. It's more like it's, it's hard to imagine this, but it's more like karma. Like you're not, you're, it's a mirror. So you're putting in this energy and then the ground is returning the energy. And so if it feels painful to you, it's that that's the ground communicating to you and your nervous system communicating to you that you're just not ready for that yet. So maybe you should adjust your form so that that stimulation isn't so intense. And obviously, it's really easy to mute that stimulation when you wear marshmallow running shoes. But the problem with that is, is it mutes the initial impact and then you might not realize how much harder you're running, how much uh, harder on your joints you're going to be by running the way you are. So that's why you want to run raw so you can kind of listen to the ground, listen to the feedback, and it's going to help you slow down and run more softly. The third thing, third principle, is lifestyle. You want to make sure you're getting enough sleep, right? And and this isn't a one-size-fits-all approach either. You know, I'm not going to recommend here that everybody get eight hours of sleep a night because eight hours of sleep for one person might be completely different than eight hours of sleep for another. Um, there's there's something called quality of sleep, right? Maybe you, you sleep six and a half hours at night, but your quality of sleep is such that you are more well rested than somebody who slept a total of eight. So you want to make sure that you're getting good quality sleep. And I mean, there's a, that's a whole nother video topic, but you just don't want to be neglecting your rest and you don't want to be neglecting your nutrition either. See, when we're going out running, especially if we're running every day, that's going to be breaking down your muscles. That's going to be putting a lot of stress on your tendons, joints, ligaments, and bones. So you want to make sure that you're eating the right type of diet for you. Again, this isn't a one size fits all approach. Uh, I would just recommend listening to your body and trying out foods that your that your body reacts to well and that you can absorb well. For me, for example, I find that having a diet high in animal products means that I'm eating a diet full of bioavailable nutrients. So therefore, I'm, a, uh, I'm able to recover faster. And then this one is a little bit um, unintuitive, but mindfulness. This is also part of your lifestyle. So what I mean by this is that if you're trying to become an athlete, you want to be mindful of other things that you're doing that might not be helping you reach your athletic goals. And maybe you want to be mindful of the risks that you might be taking in your day-to-day -day life that might cause acute injuries that would prevent you from getting better at running. So I'm not saying be some sort of super cautious person and never you know, live in a bubble and then only commit to running and then that's how you're going to get better. It's just realize that, let's say, you know, you and your friends are challenging each other to a one rep max in your deadlift, you know, that might cause an issue down the road. So just be careful if you're trying to go for some athletic endeavor, know that you're already putting a level of stress in your body that maybe your body is not capable of handling too much outside stress. So you got to get your priorities straightened out. And then principle, principle number four is movement variability. So if you're running on a treadmill, you're going to be getting a lot of the same, um, it's a lot of repetitive motion. There's no variability in the terrain. 
So while you might be better off running on a treadmill if you want to avoid tripping on over a stump or um, stubbing your toe on a rock or whatever, you're much better off in the long run incorporating some trail running into the mix. And the reason for this is because the variable surfaces in a trail will allow uh, the activation of different muscles and overall it'll just create a more balanced result. So you can think of it like when you're running on a flat surface like a road or a treadmill, you're greatly reducing the chance of, um, of injury you know, via an accident, but you are greatly increasing the chance of injury, uh, in injury via um, repetitive stress. And so with trail running, you're greatly reducing the chance of injury via repetitive stress, but you are greatly increasing the chance of injury uh, via, you know, some sort of acute injury, you know, you falling, you having an accident. So just keep that in mind. And also you do want uh, to look at cross training. So obviously this is plan B. It's not necessarily something that you want to do you don't want to necessarily incorporate this into your training as a default, but just have this as a backup. If you do feel like something isn't going the best for you, maybe take a step back, get on the bike, get on, uh, if you do ski mountaineering, uh, go for a hike, take it easy, go for a walk. You'll get right back on track soon enough, but it's it's way better to do that than to sort of be gung-ho and get out there regardless of how your how your body's telling you that maybe you should slow down. And also uh, another kind of cross training is strength training. So this is a bit debatable in the running community because again, like you see the Kenyans, they're not really incorporating a lot of strength training into their um, regimens. But the thing is, is that if you go out there and let's say you're a great runner and you focus on your strengths, you can you can only do two pull-ups and you focus on your strengths and you avoid, um, you, you double down on your strengths when you avoid your weaknesses, you avoid focusing on your weaknesses. The problem with this is that you might not realize that if you were to balance a little bit your training approach and incorporate uh, leveling up your weaknesses a little bit, it might make you a more well-rounded runner and uh, have a more sustainable um, sort of running career as a result. So it's really important to kind of be open-minded to the idea of strength training. Ultimately, things like calisthenics and even lifting heavy is, uh, is gonna translate somewhat to building a body more suitable for the impacts that are uh, that running results in. And another kind of training style you can incorporate is things like yoga or uh, movement flow. And what this will do is it kind of loosens up your body a little bit and kind of gets the blood flowing to the places that uh, might be neglected. So, you know, try that out as well. It's, it's actually going to benefit you more than you think, you know, a lot of people out there, they're really good runners and they only run and they might not have time for these other things, but many of these people would be surprised to see the results that they would get if they were to incorporate a little bit of cross training, a little bit of strength training, a little bit of movement flow or yoga or stretching into their training uh, regimens. And so principle number five is Self-awareness, be aware of your limitations, right? Like, no, let's say you're starting at point A and you wanna to get to point B. Well, before you even determine what point B is, you gotta to need to know where you are starting from. So if there's an ultra marathon coming up in three months and you haven't even ran a 5K before, I mean, that's probably a little bit grandiose of a goal for you at this time. So you want to be realistic and um, be aware of the risks of challenges, right? On YouTube, there's a lot of these uh, challenge videos, people doing something pretty intense for the views, for the memes. And while this does add a little bit of uh, novelty to life, a little spark of uh, something interesting, you want to be mindful of what this can result in, which is injury. You know, if you push your body too hard, inevitably, 
It's kind of like if you live long enough, inevitably you will get cancer. If you push your body hard enough, inevitably you will get injured. I mean, even listen to David Goggins. The guy's a badass, but he admits that his training style is uh, is very likely to result in injury, especially in the beginning for somebody who's new to that level of intensity. So you just want to, just like um, I was saying, kind of be aware where you're at. Be aware of where you're at and... Uh, in relative in relation to the types of challenges that you want to take on i think that they're cool and uh, they can add value and kind of show you where you're at in your fitness journey but i wouldn't recommend challenges all the time and then be aware of how long it takes to build a base see this is kind of related to the uh, know where you're at but also Know how long it's going to take to get from where you're at to where you want to go. So be realistic in that regard as well. It's not so easy to get out there running out your marathon or, or a marathon. I mean, anybody can cover a marathon distance, but not everybody can recover uh, in, a, in a sort of quick fashion. You know, a lot of people might take two weeks to be able to walk normally again. And the whole point of becoming invincible is to be able to run a marathon, maybe not so fast in the beginning, but be able to run a marathon and actually sort of be able to get back up on your feet within 24, 48 hours. Like, wouldn't that be amazing? Wouldn't, isn't that what we all want is to kind of be able to train, but not necessarily be out of commission afterwards? Like, I'm not training to check off a box and then be able to just rest the rest of the day. Like, I want to incorporate movement as part of my lifestyle. And then last but not least, uh, the last part of part five is having humility, right? Like, you, you just want to chill out a little bit. Like, realize that uh, we're all on our own journeys. Some people are more genetically gifted than others. Some people have uh, more of a base than others. And we're all you know, in our unique position. So just be humble and uh, over time, things will develop. So anyways, that those are the five principles um, in order for you to become invincible at running. And so I hope that you enjoyed this video and don't forget to like and subscribe. Uh, there's going to be more videos like this coming your way soon.